Lenny Anderson can't escape a sinister plan of attack at ten past ten. First on BBC One, Panorama with David Dimbleby. It's been one of the most bizarre weeks in British politics. Tomorrow could see Britain with a new Prime Minister chosen not by the voters, but by a tiny electorate of 329 MPs. John Major, commanding a majority in the House of Commons and with two years to run, said he wanted this election to clear the air. During the campaign, the air has thickened as disagreements on policy have become more strident and a sense of panic of a party staring defeat in the face has begun to become palpable. In Panorama tonight, John Redwood, the challenger, and Brian Mawinney from John Major's campaign team will face questions from their opponents, among them four MPs, Sir Norman Fowler and David Mellor, who want a major victory, Ian Duncan Smith and Barry Legg, who are rooting for John Redwood. Listening and then having their say in turn, an audience of concerned Tory supporters here in the studio in London, and in two constituencies, one of which sides with John Redwood, one with John Major. Just before we start that, we asked two of the Tory party's most senior members what they believe is at stake for the party and for Britain tomorrow. What is at stake for the country is whether it, uh, can have a, whether it will have a government which is able to govern effectively on the lines which the country elected it for. And uh, at stake for the Conservative Party is whether Conservatives are willing to give the Prime Minister and the government the support to which they are, in our view, entitled. Tomorrow's vote is about the result of the next election, whether it's to be lost on Mr Heath's policies which lost the elections in 74, or won on Margaret Thatcher's which won elections in 79, 83 and 87. And it's about the future of Britain, whether we're to drift backwards into being a province or whether we're to retain our nation state. Well, two views there on the election that takes place tomorrow. Now, uh, Brian Mawinney and John Redwood, I'd like to start with you, Mr. Redwood. And uh, in a moment, I'll be asking Sir Norman Fowler and David Mellor to dispute various points in your program with you. Um, I'd just like to put one question to you first, though. When Michael Heseltine challenged Mrs. Thatcher for the leadership, she had lost two senior cabinet ministers over her policy, apart from him, and was committed to a, a policy on the poll tax which was generally thought to be leading the party to a disaster. By comparison, you sat in the cabinet until a week ago, and I put it to you that your complaints against John Major are trivial by comparison with the complaints that Heseltine had against Thatcher. But the big difference is that Margaret Thatcher did not resign the leadership, whereas John Major did decide to resign the leadership. He invited a challenge, whether I challenged or not, there was going to be a challenge. There were a queue of contenders lining up. I think it's better that it is a serious challenge, that the arguments are put so that the Prime Minister can clear the air in the way he asked us to do. But are you saying that the arguments are so crucial for the future of the party, on the one hand, and yet not so crucial that you had to leave the Cabinet uh, earlier over them, that you were able to sit in there and let all the things that have been done be done? Well, I think they are very crucial issues. They are about the future of the nation as well as the future of the Conservative Party and our electability at the next election. But yes, I was quite happy to sit in a collective government led by John Major. I enjoyed working with him. I had to put certain points of view, uh, views that I hold strongly, and I accepted the collective discipline. I won some, I lost some. I defended the common line like any other cabinet minister. What I could not defend was the Prime Minister's judgment that he should resign the leadership and open the whole thing up. He made it inevitable that it was going to be a public debate. Once it was inevitable that it was going to be a public debate, I thought someone should come forward to put the arguments in public so that the party can decide. And I look forward to the judgment of my colleagues in Parliament so that we then know, and I do hope, we have a clear judgment, a clear decision, one way or the other, so that we can then get on with the job of governing and winning the next election. So, so you are really telling the British public, the voter, the people watching this programme, that John Major's cabinet was split down the middle on some very serious issues, which you believe, if not resolved, will lose the party the next election, that it's as serious as that? I'm saying that we were debating around the cabinet table very serious issues, as cabinets tend to do, 
And yes, we, we have strong opinions, and we didn't all think the same. That's the point of a cabinet. It is the way in which the party argues the case out and then provides a lead to all the other parliamentarians once it has decided its position. And I was happy to do that. I was very privileged to do that and, and proud to be in the cabinet. Right. But once he decided that we had to conduct it in public, which was the direct consequence of the Prime Minister's decision to resign the leadership of our party, I felt then uh, our arguments needed a champion so that the party could decide in the way he wants us to do. Norman Fowler. John, I mean, the surveys agree that uh, most constituencies, most conservative constituencies, in fact, uh, support uh, John Major. And what many party members uh, cannot understand is why a cabinet member, a member of the government since 1990, of John Major's government since 1990, should now be standing against him. Particularly, they can't understand it, against the background of some of your previous comments. I have one from the Western Mail, which you only made in March of this year in which you were asked about your ambitions to become leader. You said, it's not an issue. I have no plans to become prime minister. It's not an issue. And then you went on to say, and I quote, we have a prime minister. I'm very happy to support him. I voted for him. I support him. Indeed. That's very loyal. Why did you change your mind? Well, I just explained, Norman, why I changed my mind. The leader I supported and backed <clears throat> resigned his job. He walked away from it. And he said he wanted to clear the air by having a competition. There was bound to be a competition he, once he resigned, because then any two names could propose a third name, and there were lots who were going to do that. So I did not feel I could defend that decision. If you cannot defend the decision of your leader or former leader, if you cannot defend the decision of your prime minister, then you clearly have to leave the cabinet. So I did the honorable thing. So but I would like to take issue with your premise. It is quite true that those cons conservative constituencies that met early, uh, often before I had emerged as a challenger, uh, did naturally say they entirely supported the Prime Minister, and I'd expect them to do so. Uh, over this last weekend, a lot of our colleagues have been consulting their constituencies, having had two or three days listening to what I've been saying. The position is very much <coughs> more mixed than you're suggesting, and a lot of them who have been consulted by MPs of no strong opinion have discovered that it's roughly 50-50 well, in have, those constituencies. I have, to tell, I have to tell you, I, I have to tell you that uh, I... <coughs> I'm not quite sure where you're getting your information from, but that's certainly, certainly not the information that I am getting uh, in the Midlands uh, and indeed, I think, throughout much of the country. Okay. David so, but what you're really David saying... David Mellie, you'll have to give him a chance. Yes, of course. Can I just put this point in? So you're saying that if the Prime Minister had not called the election himself, if that had been the case, then you would not have stood against him under not. any circumstances. Absolutely not. And in spite of the fact that you have very serious reservations about a whole range of his policies, you would have been content to have sat there in John Major's cabinet. Indeed I would, because I think it would have been my duty to put those arguments from within and live with the collective decision. I know, Norman, when you were in the government, you didn't always agree with the collective decision, but you don't walk out every time a collective decision goes against you. But you and have, I meant but, but what you I have said put last whole March. I did John, you have put a whole of... range of points um, against the Prime Minister, against John Major. No, no, certainly, not against certainly, him. certainly, had certainly I been not. out of sympathy with Margaret Thatcher's general policies, I would have left. All but right. you seem to be out of sympathy with no. John Major's David, 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 David Miller, you must have been out of sympathy David with John Miller. Major, and he's achieved a lot for us in the past. But this election is about the future. Once you are a candidate for the leadership of our party, it is your duty to put forward a vision and to see if your colleagues so. like it or not. But it is an absurd volt fast it, that you're telling Gillian Shepherd on the Thursday evening that you support the Prime Minister. I did you're... not say that. So she lied about that, did she? I did not tell Gillian that I was going to vote for the Prime Minister in the ballot. I had not made up my mind. I did ring up Gillian to see how she felt about the situation. <laughs> so when she said that you did, she was lying, was she? Well, all I can say is I did not tell anyone that I was well, going to vote for John Major in the ballot because I had not made up my mind. And as you well know, the press camped outside my house for three days because they were well aware that I hadn't made up my mind and they wanted to know what my decision the, was. The following day, your former special advisor, a key member of your campaign, Mr. Hill Williams, said that you'd been a consistent supporter of the Prime Minister since John Major became leader of the Conservative Party and you continue to be a supporter of the Prime Minister. You say you are happy to be in his government and then you're producing literature that says no change, no chance. This is extraordinary. You're not merely taking issue uh, with the Prime Minister on the basis that he's creating an election. Why shouldn't you stand? Why couldn't you have stood aside like everyone else did so the Conservative Party could unite? 
you're actually attacking the Prime Minister fundamentally, in suggesting, not merely implying, suggesting explicitly that if there isn't a change, the Conservatives have no chance of winning the next election. That's a nonsensical overstatement of the position, isn't it? I am conducting a debate in public because the Prime Minister invited the party to do just that. But it does I think debate the party now you. needs to have a choice. I'm offering the party that choice, and as a good Democrat, I will live with the democratic judgment of the Conservative members of Parliament. And so having said, until tomorrow, no change, no chance, that we have no chance of winning the election, you'll go back to saying we have every chance of winning the election afterwards. Is life really as simple as that? I think there will be some changes as a result of tomorrow, so then I will be quite happy. Would you have, well, well um, hold on, can, John Redwood, John Redwood, can you, can you just answer, can you answer the question that he put to you? I if you I lose, did. will you be there rooting for John Major in the belief that he can win the election? Yes, Simple I've already question. said publicly that one vote uh, margin for me is quite enough, I think, for me to unite the party, and so the same must apply to John Major. It's and if John Major wins by just one vote margin, he will have my support because I would accept the judgment of the party. Does, does it worry you that after what happened with Margaret Thatcher in 1990, mm -hmm. that the Conservative Party is getting a reputation for not standing behind its leaders when it comes to rough times? Well, I think you have to ask yourself about the direction of the party and whether we're winning enough elections or not. And I want to belong to a winning team. I'd like to lead a winning team. And I think we do need to change what we're doing to reassure all those voters whom John Major helped attract to us in 92, who are now very disillusioned with the government and want something different in order to woo but, them back. All right, I'm going to bring in the Vale of Glamorgan, who've been listening to this, the Conservatives down there, majority of 19 only. What's your view about the Redwood Challenge? Any of you? Mike Pryor, perhaps you'll kick off. Well, certainly the view in, in the association overall, I think, is that when we won this seat back in 1992 with just 19 votes, as you say, a large part of the success in that campaign was due very much to a strong personal vote for, for John Major. So what do you say, Joe? Well, well we, we, rec we, recognize that, we recognize that time's moved on, and we've grown to respect John Redwood from his time in the Welsh office. But I think, uh, certainly the view in, from the people I've been speaking to in the association, that it would make life here holding this seat in the future very much more difficult if we don't have John Major leading us into well, the next election. What's, what's the difficulty with John Redwood? What's the difficulty, one of you, with John Redwood? Well, I... Well, there's no difficulty, <laughs> but uh, the criticism of John Major when he took over the leadership was that he'd only held a few major positions in the cabinet. Now, John Redwood ha hasn't held any, so what does he feel he can offer the electorate in Britain? Well, he is Wales. very inexperienced. <laughs> All right, J John well, Redwood. He's, he's trying to be uh, Prime Minister, obviously, so I say Britain. Well, I think the Welsh Secretaryship is a very important job, but I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed that the Vale of Glamorgan thinks otherwise. One of the... <laughs> One of the advantages of the Welsh Secretaryship is, of course, uh, I did get direct experience of education, health, transport, planning, economic development, local government, agriculture, the whole range of government policies. And I was responsible for them in Wales, and I was there around the Cabinet Committee table to make my contribution to the general debate about the United Kingdom aspects of those policies. So I don't think I'm without experience. I did also chair an industrial PLC, which I think may have helped me a bit. All right, well, I'm going to bring the audience in here. Dave Miller, do you want to make a quick point before I do? Surely, John, you have enough experience not to go making empty populist gestures, like promising that there could be five billion pounds of public expenditure cuts immediately. After all, so in the two years that you've been Welsh Secretary, your block has increased from 6.3 billion to 6.8 billion. And you have agreed and negotiated with the Treasury an increase in real terms over the next three years of 3%. It doesn't sound as though you practice what you preach, does it? Or that it may not be quite as easy as you're pretending. Well, doesn't it show? <laughs> doesn't it show I was quite an effective Welsh Secretary at arguing the case for Wales around the Cabinet table? Uh, oh, but you should also cases. remember... So that's a very trite, but, uh, that's but, a very trite well, David, answer to a serious point. An you're saying, well, I think you should try a little better than that. Well, I you're will, making if a you give me a chance. Point, you're, right. saying that me spending, a you're saying that spending ministers have a duty to spend money. So I don't think, I think that sits that's rather part ill. Of, with part your putting of my on case the hair is that we need to change. There can be an immediate public expenditure cut. David, please listen. Uh, we need to change that mentality around the cabinet table which says that the Secretary of State has done exceptionally well if he wins a lot of extra money for his department. We need to think as a team and realize that we need to reduce the totals a bit more. Now, of course, it can be done. I sat around the cabinet table when we reduced the figures by nine billion. And if we'd done a little bit more, it would have been even better. But it is a very important priority. I read in today's papers 
that the government is now thinking of six billion of tax cuts, more than anything I've suggested, out of the reserves. Now, is that true or false? Where did that come from? Because it looked like very authoritative briefing. All right, I'm going to bring in members of the audience. Now, can we go to the issues that John Redwood has raised on taxation, on Europe, anything you want to comment on? Yes, the woman in green. I would like to take issue with John Redwood, actually, on the, the constituency reports. We did a cascade report in North Cornwall uh, this last weekend, and in fact, John Major had a very large majority. We are a marginal seat. They believe he is the best prime minister. He has statesmanship. He can unite the party. He has dealt with very difficult decisions in very difficult circumstances. He has integrity and courage. Well, what about the, offer, what about the proposal that John Redwood is putting forward for tax cuts, which he says John Major won't introduce? What there do you make are of that? issues which need to be looked at, but by changing John Major, we need to change the cabinet, <coughs> not John Major. Uh, he is the best person to run the country. All right. Are any of you concerned? Yes, the woman here. Are you concerned about the promise of tax cuts? Do you think that will actually win people in a way that John Major won't be able to? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. I'm very concerned that, that we need to be very careful and cautious we need to allow our businesses to improve their position worldwide but so that we can afford the proper social care that the people of this country but need. isn't he your man then no indeed he's not why the not? prime minister is my man i would like to ask him um why does he think why does john redwood think that he can do more to improve the morale of the party workers than john major and All I right. would like to suggest that John Major, a resounding victory for John Major tomorrow, is All the right. only way we can achieve that. Yeah. Why can yeah. you? Yeah. How, how, how do you improve morale of a dispirited party? Well, as people from the Vale of Good Morgan will know, I've done a lot of doorstep campaigning, both in Wales and in my own constituency, for recent elections. And I tried to listen very carefully to what the voters were telling us and try to find out why they are not going out to vote Conservative at the moment or even switching their allegiance. And they are telling me that we do need to make changes in the things we're doing, and I've tried to identify those changes in the proposals I've put forward in this leadership campaign. As to unity, the thing which has divided the parliamentary party most in the last two or three years is the issue of Europe. It has been difficult legislation on Europe, transferring more powers to the European institutions that has divided the party. I give this promise. If I were Prime Minister, I would not make further proposals to transfer major powers to Europe that required legislation to pass the House of Commons. That would remove the main problem. All right. Who wants to, who wants to bring up a, a European point? Well, Europe, Europe, yes. I'd like to ask uh, John Redwood, would he be in favour of the single currency if it was a pound with the Bank of England yeah. controlling it? No, I would not be. With the Bank it, of England controlling it? Well, it could not actually be under the Bank of England control under the rules of the treaty. What I don't want to see is the transfer of all the major instruments of economic power, the right to settle interest rates, the right to fix tax levels and borrowing levels, from a democratic UK parliament to an unelected European institution. This is a fundamental constitutional change, and I welcome this opportunity to put the arguments before the British people. I am inundated with letters from around the country saying, good on you, John, you've told it to us as it is. We don't want these powers to transfer from the United Kingdom. I'll just take a few more points. Yes, sir. With respect, Mr. Redwood, that is not the issue here with, you, with regard to Europe. The issue is whether you value our opt-out, our potential opt-out from the European Natural. currency, or not. Yes. You are saying, basically, that there is everything to be gained from tearing that up, walking away from the negotiating table. Remember, no. we are the financial capital of Europe, one of the prime financial centres, as you know, of, of the world. world. And one as a consequence, centers. it is important for us to have an influence on what happens yeah. to the financial structure of Europe. Right. Yeah. Okay, you made the point. Anybody else feel strongly about it? Yes, the, the, the gentleman in the middle there. What I can't understand is how Mr. Redwood imagines that his position on Europe is necessarily going to unite the party. Yeah. All right. I would have thought Leave it that, that. His How is it going to unite the party when you've got oh. 50, 60 MPs who hold exactly the opposite view to you? Well, I'm not sure it's as many as that. But what I'm saying is that... Well, this is an is important it? point. Uh, how, many, how, I, many, how many well, hoses? Let's leave the numbers for a moment. I just take 30 seconds, John. You're right. um, surely the point is this, that uh, the majority of the parliamentary party actually support the position of the prime minister in keeping the That's options right. open. Yeah. They're, not, right. they're, not, they're not saying we... Sh 
They're not saying we should join the single currency. They're saying the option should be kept open. And until a few days ago, you yourself were yeah. supporting that policy. You voted for Maastricht. You have got to actually, uh, I think, explain to the nation why your views have changed in this fundamental way. All right. well, I was then speaking as Welsh Secretary as part of a collective government that had reached that decision. And I told you earlier, I thought it was better to stay inside the government and argue the case, because the colleagues have different views on these issues, and they have to be represented around the cabinet table. But I do not believe, Norman, that many people in the parliamentary party want to abolish the pound. But I do not believe that many people in the parliamentary party want to see our economic destiny settled by unelected officials no. in Europe rather than settled in the United Kingdom Parliament. That is the issue. I'm very grateful that John Major did not agree to us going into a single currency. I'm saying, let's tell everybody now what the answer is. But that will Businesses not need to the start that planning will not today the party. if we were going to go into one in the next three or four years. We do not want all the expense and the hassle and the constitutional change. All right, I'm going to have to stop you there and move on to Brian Mawinney, who's here speaking on behalf of the Prime Minister's campaign and who's going to be questioned by Ian Duncan Smith and by Barry Legg. But first of all, Mr Mawinney, from... John Major's point of view, and speaking from the public's point of view really, isn't it likely to seem a self-indulgent, almost a petulant act of a Prime Minister who's got a working majority in the House of Commons, who's got nearly two years to go till a general election, to put the whole thing at risk simply because he's angry at sniping from some of his backbenchers? But it's not angry at sniping by some of his backbenchers, David. For three years now, we've had a small minority of people in the party who have disputed, who have debated, who have divided. And each year when the opportunity came for someone to challenge for the leadership, that all melted away and there was no challenge. But it was then renewed again. And I think that the Prime Minister took a very bold and courageous decision when he finally said... <laughs> when he finally said, this is going on, it has got to stop. It is undermining the credibility of the government. It is a distraction. It is dividing the party, as you can, uh, as you can see. So let's have a leadership election. Let's give the opportunity for others, if they so wish, to test their views against my view as Prime Minister, Prime Minister on behalf of the Cabinet, uh, and let the members of Parliament decide. And that's what they're going to do tomorrow. And clear the air and restore unity as a result of this last week? Well, one of the things that I think is going to emerge from this, um, the Prime Minister is going to win tomorrow. He's going to win with a significant majority. And I believe that the party will be intolerant of those who then want to continue yeah. this... Uh, that, you, you, me, meaning, this meaning, let, let me just finish. In, in this, in this in sort of divisiveness, meaning, and I pay, tribute, I pay tribute to John Redwood for the fact that he has made it clear that he will have no part of any such uh, activity, and I believe him, and I, uh, I appreciate uh, what he has said in that regard. Intolerant in the sense that there'll be or risk deselection by their parties and won't be able to stand in the next election as Conservatives, no, presumably you mean, because what else is it? No, that is not what I mean, though in some cases that may be its manifestation. But there is a strong desire in the party to unite behind the Prime Minister, behind the government, and to get on, and to get on with addressing the real issues of politics, which are the successes that this government's policies are having for the country, and to warn the country of the dangers that the policies of a Labour or Lib Dem party would present to them at a general election. Ian Duncan Smith. Brian, just moving on beyond your points about uh, tolerance and intolerance, which doesn't sound the language of a party coming together, I must admit. But if I could perhaps ask you a question about the single currency. I wonder, just to start it off, could you perhaps tell me, uh, or name me, uh, a self-governing country that does not have its own currency? Well, we all have uh, our own currencies, as, as we do. Can you name me one that doesn't? It's self-governing? Uh, not uh, offhand. Thanks. Barry, it's over to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, 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 just to enlighten the viewer, is there one? No. No, no right. No, Thank you. No. Rhetorical question. Uh, Brian, I think Brian, I th Brian. We obviously have a united view Brian. here. <laughs> Brian, you, you, you made a comment about the Prime Minister testing his leadership on behalf of the Cabinet. 
Could you confirm that the Prime Minister did consult every member of his cabinet before he made his decision to resign as party leader? Uh, oh, my, my understanding is that uh, all members of the cabinet were made aware of the Prime Minister's decision, but the Prime Minister made before, a decision. Before he announced it? That's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Um, turning now to the, the single currency, which seems to be the biggest difference between John Redwood and John Major. One of the useful things about this campaign is actually helping to clarify Conservative policy. And I think John Major's position on the single currency is still unclear because he said that the pound will be abolished if it is in the national interest. Now, can you tell me on behalf of John Major, in what circumstances would it be in the national interest to abolish the pound? What the Prime Minister has said for a very considerable time, supported by the Cabinet, was that there may come a time when we have to face up to the issue of a single currency. That time is not now. You know that, I know that. He said it wasn't going to be in 97. Everyone now agrees it isn't going to be in 97. It may be true of some for 1999. It will clearly not be true for many in 1999. And the Prime Minister has made it consistently clear that if and when a decision has to be made, the decision ought to be made in the context of the position, the relevant factors at that time. It makes no sense on behalf of the United Kingdom interest in Europe to make a decision now which thereby undermines his ability to influence what's going to happen in Europe in the intervening years. And those intervening years may be quite a number, Barry. Well, well, well Brian, you've given a very long answer, but you haven't answered the question. John Major, in, in 1991, John Major signed a treaty which set down that a, there would be a single currency in 1999. And I put to you this basic point. Under what circumstances would it be in the national interest to abolish the pound? Could we have an answer tonight? Barry, it was this Prime Minister, it was our Prime Minister, who negotiated the opt-out at Maastricht. Unlike the other heads of government, John Major understood the significance, the long-term potential consequences of a single currency, and he alone negotiated the opt-out so that this country would be able to make a judgment if and when the time came as to the circumstances, he has made it clear that that would go to the cabinet. Well, well, the it, cabinet would make a decision <laughs> and make representations to parliament. And no, parliament well, would then it's, it's make, Smith, do you want to come back on this? Make a judgment. Yeah, the the, the fact this, is that, that that is, if it happens, is years away. Barry, what you and I don't agree about is that I do not believe, the cabinet does not believe, that the Prime Minister should undermine his ability to influence the debate in Europe, which is of huge importance to the United Kingdom national interest by making a decision now. Brian, perhaps I could, uh, just briefly. Perhaps I could press you on this one. Um, it seems to me that you're saying that there, therefore, are circumstances in which Britain may join a single currency. I simply want to get to the bottom of what those circumstances are. Could you perhaps enlighten us as to what they are? Well, Ian, the difficulty is that we're talking about something which may or may not happen some years, <laughs> some years in advance. There are political considerations, there are economic considerations, there are constitutional considerations. Now, it is easy to take a line that says, we'll make a decision today, irrespective of what may be the circumstances sometime in the future. Now, let, me, let me ask you a follow-up. Let me ask but, you a follow-up to that. Let me ask you a follow-up to that. But the issue is, what is in the best national okay. yeah, interest? Right. Well, let, and let me, I know this, you answer, let me, let me I know you this, Prime, I know this Prime Minister better than most people. We are next door neighbours. 20 years ago this summer, within a few weeks of each other, we were each selected for neighbouring constituencies. This Prime Minister will not trim for some possible short-term political advantage at the expense of the national interest which he was elected to pursue. You say, you say that that's the case. Can I ask you then, you said earlier on in an answer, Brian, you said earlier on in an answer that in making a decision now for 99, that actually we would lose influence in Europe. 
How is it actually that we are able to take a decision about the social provisions of Europe and say no to those and now electrify the debate in Europe, influence decision making and have the Germans coming and saying we want to have what the British have got. Why are we doing that when we say no, positive, forceful, but we daren't say it on a single currency, surely we would have more influence because they'd respect us for it. All right, keep Ian, it brief uh, if you would, Dr. Moore. I'd, I'd be happy to. Ian, there's a difference between the possibility sometime in the future of a single currency and the issues that would be associated with that the and the social chapter because the social issues occur now, yeah. Ian. Yeah. Now. So then now for as the single I, currency. As I, go, so as I go to transport currency. council meetings, I face the prospect of people adding social costs to transport infrastructure now. So the, exactly the, 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 the social exactly chapter the opt-out is relevant exactly the now. Argument. The single currency issue is relevant years now. in right. the future. I want, to, I want to bring in Faversham uh, now. The Conservatives in Faversham who have been listening to this, uh, they suffered heavy losses in the last local election, though they have a majority in their constituency. Now, the uh, agenda that's been put forward here was all about Europe. That was their choice, opposing um, John Major. What's your view about the uh, Redwood campaign? and uh, John Major's likelihood of holding on. Why are you opposed to Major, as I believe most of you are? John Burke, um, do you want to start? I've just been listening to Brian Moore Winnie, and I think we're going down with a sinking ship. Yeah. I was one of 9,000 counters that lost their seat in the last two years. And the public, our voters, the traditional Conservatives, want changes. Uh, John Major isn't proposing any changes, and I don't think talking to people out in the street, we're going to get any changes. What are the or changes? What are the changes you want to get and get think John you'll get from John Redwood? We might get decapping of local authorities. We, we might get a better start on Europe. We need John Redwood. We need. If you go out, the pe trouble is the major people. They're forgetting what's happening out there in the streets. Yeah. The people are not voting for the Conservative Party because of John Major and his cabinet. And it's about time they realise that. As a local councillor, talking to local residents, law and order is one of the main things. They seem to think that everything is forgotten. And I know from listening to Redwood and reading what he's. Uh, has said that capital punishment is certainly a vote catcher and good for you John Redford, go for yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Just, uh, let, me just, uh, let me just interrupt since capital punishment is, is mentioned very briefly John Redwood, that would be a free vote if you were leading the party just as it always has been, wouldn't yes, it? Yes it would have to be. So it would make vote. no germane difference but to whether it was introduced I or not. I would vote for it. Right. Brian yeah. Winnie, do you want to answer what they were saying from Fabersham? Incidentally since I was elected in 79 I have always voted for it uh, also. All of us um, members of Parliament, all of us know that the single overriding message that we've had over the last 12 to 18 months is the party is divided. There is division. We should have learned from the lesson of the Labour Party in the 1980s. That's the single underlying theme that comes through. And this particular election tomorrow is going to address that, and I believe set it to one side, so that together, because we are all part of the same party, Together, we can move on to make sure that this government gets re-elected and the people who we all collectively believe would be more damaging to the national interest, a Labour government or a Lib Dem government, doesn't get right. elected. That's why tomorrow is so important. Who here, who here wants to see Major out and Redwood in? Yes, the, the man in the, in the second row from the back there. I want to see him out and I, I give you the reasons. I am astounded how little the people are informed what, ab about the single currency. Just one point, and that includes the minister and unfortunately Sir Norman. To get to a single currency, you first have to have economic union. It says so in the Maastricht Treaty, which nobody apparently ever read. Okay, and, fine. The gentleman there. Yes, I mean, I, I don't particularly think the divisions at the party over Europe that we've had are particularly relevant. What the people out there want? They want sound policies, they want low yeah. taxation, yeah. they want more more law and order and they want better services run, run for them and they don't want to be taxed to the hilt. That's what the public are bothered. Well, bothered you think about. John Major's lost the tax agenda, do you? That he's well, no he longer a low tax... I mean, the taxes have increased. There's 43% of our GDP still taken by the state and we still take as much tax as we All did right, in All right, briefly, and I'll come to you, Fabersham, but you... Well, what all you of say? us as Conservatives are instinctive tax cutters. But, but all of us... But they say all, you don't do it. But, but wait a minute. All of us as Conservatives also believe in sound money. That's what John uh, and I have supported in Cabinet. And given a public sector borrowing requirement which rose to a billion pounds a week, we both supported, um, John in the Cabinet, I subsequently, the 
tax increases that Norman Lamont brought forward and that have been carried forward. The tough decisions have been made and John Major and the Chancellor has made it clear time and time again that we will move to reduce tax as soon as it is prudent to do so. And if that is not the formula, then the suggestion must be that others would wish to reduce tax when it's not prudent to do so. Uh, who, and who that is not that, an election This is winner. not the proper answer. And how would, you, how would you change it? Yes, sitting here in the front. People in the United Kingdom, Conservative voters, have lost their homes, their businesses, and God knows what, because of John Major's obsession with sticking to the ERM. Yeah. He hasn't learned anything from this. This is not what people want. The ordinary man in the street does not want to get involved in some outrageous experiment which could end in financial catastrophe. Tax and the ERM is what is constantly alleged against your government, isn't it? And against, indeed, the government of which well, John uh, Redwood is a member. This is, a, this is a, an issue which the government has had to face coming out of a recession. The decisions which this government have taken has meant that economic growth in this country was the fastest in Europe. It will be this year. Those are the consequences, the economic consequences that are flowing. And I have to say to, to you that they are the precondition for the tax cuts which instinctively this party wants, this government wants, and it will produce just as soon as it is prudent to do so. Any, anyone here who came undecided and having listened to this brief resume of arguments has made up their minds? Yes, the man there. If, as Conservatives, we are instinctively in favour of sound money, why did we force through Parliament a bill to increase our contributions to Brussels to eight and a half billion pounds a year, yeah, splitting yeah, yeah, the party yeah. in the process of doing it? We're complaining that John Redwood can't save five billion. We could save it just from Brussels. Are you telling me that that's well-spent money, that there's no fraud, there's no corruption? Yeah. What, I, what I am telling you is that it was this government that launched the campaign against fraud in Europe and it was the Cannes summit just last week that moved in behind the initiatives of this government to address that very issue because you and I as Conservatives consider it to be so important. All right, I'm going to take a few more points from the audience. The woman here on the very front. It seems to me that this isn't a question of taxes or crime or not being nasty to somebody called John. What we have to consider is the one major point, which is Europe. And we simply do not want to get stuck into any more of that mire of corruption and other people's money and bureaucrats with their noses right. in the crop. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you agree with that point? Well, yes, yes and no. Um, Europe is, an, Europe, is a, Europe is a separate problem. The, um, John, John Redwood has alleged that he's going to save all the money, and yet in the two, year, in the two years before he took power in the Welsh office, the um, Welsh office funding increased by 20% in real terms. In the two years since then, you would have thought he'd have been able to cut spending by the 1.6% that he says is necessary to fund his 5 billion tax cut. How do you in answer fact, being, being struck? If you failed in Wales, uh, Mr. Redwood, what makes you think you'll do better for Britain? Strong on rhetoric, but not on. <laughs> Strong on rhetoric, but not on the act. I did return tens of millions to the Treasury last year, which we didn't need to spend. Doesn't that always I happen do in these budgets? That, uh, when I saved money in many areas, as I did, I redirected it into services. I think the government should come to a collective view that rather than doing that, the money should be redirected into taxpayers' pockets. Right. Another point from here. Yes. Who hasn't spoken? The, 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 man, the man in the second row there. Yes. Thank you. On the issue of, uh, on the issue of Europe, um, I firmly believe that the only government that can help our position in Europe, which I think we all agree, is a Conservative government. And the people who've done most to try to put a Labour government in power who would drive us closer to Brussels are the balmy army who stood behind yeah, John yeah, Redwood yeah, last yeah. night. Okay. Um, in, fa fa in, in Faversham, yeah, I can hear you. What, you've just been described as part of the balmy army. Well, not you, but the people who stood behind John Redwood as part of the ba balmy army. What do you say to that? Absolute rubbish. No, We're no. talking about the electorate, the ordinary person in the streets. These are the people who, uh, who want to get rid of John Major. We're not the balmy army. Yeah. We're the people who are representing people. Martin. The right. Conservative Party will see changes in the party that will bring us the next election. Absolutely. I don't want a history lesson from Brian Moore winning. What I want is new policies for the next general election that we'll win, because yeah. I'm frightened stiff of having a Labour government. And do you, and do you just, just one, 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 last point, uh, one last point to you. Um, do you think, uh, John Burke, do you think the party can unite despite the arguments that have gone on over this past week and the divisions we see here in the studio? 
Of course it can. We've oh. always united behind an instinctively right Prime Minister. Thatcher, Major, and I hope after Tuesday, John Redwood. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we've, we've, we've got to stop there. Uh, my thanks to everybody who came here, to this audience, to the people in the constituencies, to those of you who took part in the debate, and to you, Brian Winnie, and you, John Redwood. Uh, tomorrow, it's a rather salutary thought, uh, an electorate which could fit into this studio will decide who's going to be Prime Minister of Britain. The result, 5 p.m. from all of us here in Panorama. Good night. So the results and the implications of the first ballot under scrutiny tomorrow afternoon on BBC One. There's a leadership election special starting at...